Singer. Welcome to Drum Talk TV. We are here at the Guitar Loft in Grimsby, Canada, about 40 miles east of Toronto. And I'm here with my special guest, Don George. How are you, Don? Good, thank you. Good, thank, thank you, you for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, thank you. And we have Enjoy a wonderful it. audience here. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. Really appreciate it. We're going to talk about Don's history as a drum teacher. We're going to talk about the way he gives drum lessons. And we're actually also going to talk about the evolution of drumming instruction because here in the year 2013, um, like a lot of things, drumming instruction is a lot different now than it was back in the 70s and 50s and, and 20s. Um, but in a way, it's a lot the same, isn't it? Some of it is, not all. Right. Teaching teaching's changed quite a bit, I think, at least from the drum standpoint because right. of a lot of the new techniques that have come out and uh, over the years and... A lot of the new music, new beats. I mean, when you speak of music, music genres, when I grew up, there was big band stuff. There was, you know, there was waltzes, and it was easy to categorize. But today, it certainly isn't easy to categorize. There's so many different genres yeah. of music, and they all borrow from each other, don't they? Typically, yeah. Yeah, um, and it's the drummer that keeps the beat, the time. The drummer is really the heartbeat of all genres of music, and I think even in a cappella music when singers are singing without any instruments, they have to have a metronome in their head to still stay in time. And I think listening to whatever music they listen to and drummers they listen to kind of builds that automatic metronome in their head. So we're important even when we're not there, right? That's right. Let's start with um, some materials that you've uh, shared with me on the phone over the last few months that we've been talking that I finally get to see in person. And it is, uh, I'll hold one and you hold one. These are old um, drumming instruction books that date back to, what, like the 20s? They were, I think 1923 was the original issue date of these things. But in my day when I took, uh, well all of you know that your books are anywhere from about $10, $11 to $25 depending. I paid $1.75 for my books. So that tells you how long ago it was. Which was probably a lot of money back then, right? I mean, it's all relative. Right? I don't know. My parents paid for them. Oh. <laughs> so, but, yeah, you're right. It was probably that. That's the case. And um, th these partic this particular issue is based on classics. At the top of each page, the music you're, you're learning. It's Carl is Gardner, by the way. This one's Progressive Studies from For the Snare Drum. Don't have my glasses on. And what is, I'm going to thumb through this while, while you talk about these a little bit, and then we'll move sort of to the next phase of right. drumming education. But what's the biggest difference, if anything, between the way drumming instruction, well, is presented in here versus like books that I might have studied from that were printed in the 60s and, and early 70s? Well, is there a fundamental difference or just notation differences? Well, in this case, this was all based on classics, okay? So it was pretty heavy-duty reading, as you can see from that one. Right. Absolutely. And the notation was a little bit different. They've I'll simplified notation for what it was. And, uh, yeah, I actually went through that book. Really? Book for you. Yeah, there's some heavy stuff in here, actually. I don't think I could do it anymore. Look at that. Yeah. It's all based, if you look at the heading in here, it's all based on, on classical pieces of music. So it's, it's pretty heavy duty. But that goes back to what I was saying about when you originally learn music, you get a little book. We use the syncopation book today. And originally you would have played just for the snare drum only and tapped your right foot to keep time. But today it's, uh, today it's a little different now, and, the and way we do things. These books, Don, would they be... Um these would not be suitable for anybody that really didn't know rudiments yet. I mean, this isn't really something to learn rudiments from. No, this is not. something to apply them to yep. when you already know them, yep. right? Yeah, the rules in there and, and other things are written out as musical terms, but, but somebody who studied uh, line drumming, played in a marching band, whatever, would know the right. rudiments and can, can make that conversion. Right. And I'll, I'll take these. On that point, tell um, everybody here, we have a lot of kids here, which is great, but tell everybody watching as well how important it is to learn rudiments because I, I belong to a lot of um, groups on Facebook where people talk about drumming and of course everyone's got an opinion and there's a lot of drummers out there that say they, they don't really want to waste time learning rudiments and the funny thing about that is that well if they're playing single stroke roles and every drummer does that's a rudiment 
you know, double stroke rolls mm-hmm. or rudiment. They don't realize it, but in, in general, how important is it to learn many, if not all, of the different rudiments to apply to the drum set? Well, to the drum set, um, if, you're, if you're learning the rudiments to uh, apply to a line drummer in a marching band, it's very strict, very rigid. Um, the rudiments that myself, that I teach, are ones that are useful around the kit, not all of them. I learned, originally there was 26 drum rudiments, now there's 40 of them. But I pick and choose the ones I use around the kit and I teach the kids accordingly. The idea on the kit is you have to be a little more relaxed, it's a more easy feeling. Whereas when you're playing as a line drummer, it's very rigid, there's 10 of you, ten of you in a line, you all have to sound like one drummer only. You can't just hit the head one after the other, it has to be right together. So you have ten, ten people, so there's very rigid, it's very rigid, very structured. But on the kit, it's very comfortable, very relaxed. But there's still rudiments. Right. Talk about these two books. Um, is this the one that's older? Yes. Modern Jazz Drumming? Um, By William F. Ludwig, Jr. Right. This, this yeah. Well, here, here you go. What's the price? One dollar. One dollar. What a deal. Well, two things. It shows my age, and it also... <laughs> Also shows, you know, how expensive things were back there. But it's like worth you, like, like you said, $3 really, now, right? It would be worth more than that. <laughs> you had to go and buy it. And I'm going to hold this up for the camera over here while you talk about it. Well, William F. Ludwig which was uh, a member of the Ludwig family that makes Ludwig drums. And he put out a book. And, uh, and the books, and that was a book that covered kit playing and everything, the cymbals, right. the hi-hats, yeah, and the foot pedals there. and that. And... Um, today, some of the books are a lot more complete that way, and they're focused. Paradiddle, in, double paradiddle. Yeah. 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 On but, the cat. But we use them. That's a, that's a killer book. Uh, Joe Morello uh, from the Dave Brubeck Quartet, and uh, originally, and, and uh, he was a, a master of all of the old stuff. and. Uh, that book is very hard even for somebody like me to go through and master. Uh, he studied with... I, I guess I have to say is that when, when I was growing up, I studied the books written by the masters, but Joe Morello studied with the master before the book came out. So that was really the way to do it, you know? And that's a very difficult book. And students of drumming, you might just use your left hand and then eventually you use your right hand but you have to link it all up. Okay, you might do three strokes with the left hand, three strokes with the right hand, and you have to get very fast with it, maintaining form all the way through. And unfortunately, Joe Morello is no longer with us. He died recently. Yeah, and uh, for those of you that have li- lived under a rock for the last 60 years, um, Joe Morello, as you mentioned, played with Dave Brubeck and was uh, the drummer for Take Five which was yeah. an amazing piece of music that, that still is as contemporary as it was then. On Square Dance, uh, another one he did, but, right. but he was a great technician too, and finger techniques. Most, uh, I introduced some of the students to some of the finger techniques, but uh, most of them are working with wrists right now, but Joe was a master of, of, of the finger techniques. Right. And quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of new ones that have come out. I'll, I'll show you a little later on exactly what I mean by that. When I have a question for you in regards to drumming education, um, before we start to talk about all the new technology, and we'll get to your drum kit later, but before we even talk about YouTube and giving lessons on Skype and, and there's DVDs and everything available, I guess my question would be, what can you think of what was the biggest turning point in drum instruction before the digital age? You know, be, from the time that these books came out in the 20s and, and 50s, what was the biggest when tipping they, point in between when, then when, and now? When they went to amplifiers, like tube amps, when guitars were finally electrified and stuff like mm-hmm. that, um, it gave a totally different sound. Um, the amps themselves, uh, the foot pedals came in later for the different sounds, but it gave a lot more power. Right. Okay? Um, prior to the amps, everybody just had to play as hard and loud as they could, but when the amps came out, they could play a little easier because they had that, you know, that projection because of the amps. Right. But the drummer, he wasn't mic'd originally, and he had to beat these, well not these, but the acoustic drums like crazy to get to be heard. You so know, they didn't the really have a chance to work with dynamics, 
right? Because they always had to play loud enough. They to had be heard. They always had to play loud, and then in the early bands in the '60s and that, the drummers were very loud and very heavy hitters. Right. You know, by comparison with today, I've watched performances of live concerts on TV and been amazed by how lightly the drummer's playing. But he'll right. have a he'll have a mic right beside each of these drums and over right. the cymbals, and then one mic usually overhead for everything. So they can play a, you know a lot, a lot, with a lot less effort than they used to. Did that affect how drums, drumming education was presented because no. of amplification? No, not really. No. You, um, you mentioned, we mentioned a paradiddler. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, it just means you don't have to play as hard, make as much noise with it, right. play it a little lighter, you know, right. that's all. So it really didn't change anything that way. But um, again, it's not easy to play loud. I mean, you have to have a lot of power. You have to yeah. have really good control with the wrists and so on. And the, the newer techniques, finger techniques and so on, don't work so well when you need that kind of power. Right. Okay? They're meant for, for speed, but much less volume. Was there something big that changed in the way material like this was presented in the last, say, 10, 20, 30 years compared to the books we looked at in the 20s? and books that came out in the 60s or 70s? The biggest thing, the, the content could have been similar, but they wouldn't have had a picture like that on the front. Oh, okay. Because people wouldn't have bought it if they saw a guy out of the 20s, you know, and they said, well, <laughs> that's passe. <laughs> so the big thing was changing, you know, the drum book covers. So it was really in the marketing and packaging of it all? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that, that had a lot to do with some of the changes, but the, but the cover changes now, a lot of the times, are sort of modern art. And I'm not too big on that because it doesn't give you a good feel for what's in the book, and that's really what you want to you, know, you want to cover. So that makes sense. Yeah. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, in today's world, the biggest thing that's different about drumming instruction is when I started, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't uh, all these digital things that we have, and what I like is that I can now watch videos of like Max Roach and Lionel Hampton and Gene Krupa. Um, Papa Joe Jones, all these drummers that when I was growing up there wasn't any footage available to really see. There were certainly no TV shows showing this material. And now I can go on YouTube and watch drummers from uh, the 40s, 50s, early 60s and learn all kinds of things all over again by watching their technique and seeing how they were doing these particular crossovers or beats and things yeah. and it's really interesting. It was like watching me the other night, right? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. But that's, I think, the biggest thing is the accessibility we have and that folks um, like you can teach on Skype if we decide to. You know, we can have someone that's uh, across the country or in another country that we're communicating with and teaching lessons and everything. But I think what's great about what you do is you still teach one-on-one -on -one lessons. Yeah. Which is great. Yep. And you have some of your students here, right? It's easier on cookies. I have to buy them one by one as opposed to a box of them, okay? <laughs> Right, you, you know, tell the cook, or you have a question for everyone? Well, I was just going to say, the, 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 the group lessons, even though each of my students has, you know, private lessons, it would be good to get those of a similar level together in a group mm -hmm. for an hour every few weeks just to pound things home, yeah. you know, and that would work out great. And I'm quite willing to buy more cookies to make that happen. Let's talk you know, about so. the cookies, and I, I thought I saw a cookie here somewhere. I kept it out of your way because oh, I was afraid you were I worried about it. I was worried I wouldn't have it to show anybody. <laughs> so Don has a very special technique in the way he teaches. His his methodology for teaching, he's gonna explain, he's gonna demonstrate a lot of things, but part of his teaching has to do with cookies. Mm -hmm. Explain the whole cookie story to everybody. Well because and I wanna tell you why I want you to explain this, because okay. there's a lot of music educators that watch this. And I think we can all learn from each other. That's what Drum Talk TV is all about. You know, we've talked about it. Not all lessons happen from beyond the kit or a practice pad. They happen by paying attention and listening to discussions of other people's experiences and techniques. And this is one that I want other teachers to learn about. Well, um, maybe Tim Hortons will give me a gift card after this. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I used to always, and particularly Saturday mornings when I go in to teach, I always have coffee and uh, cookies just to nibble on in between lessons and if the student wasn't in that day I had something to nibble on. And then one morning I was teaching a little fella and he just turned around like this and said it's too tough I can't do it can't do it I'm gonna do it and his dad was saying come on you can do it I said you can do it and his dad said it and then so I said well if you're not gonna do any drumming I'm not gonna learn anything I said I'm just gonna sit here and eat a cookie 
And then I said to the little fella, I said, but, you know, do you want a piece of cookie? And he turned around, looked over his shoulder, and then he swung around again and gave him a piece of cookie. And we talked for a second, broke the stress that he was going through, and we got back into it. His dad just looked at me like he'd learned something new. So, But the cookie works wonderful. But, but I have certain students now that expect the cookie. Look at me! So it's just a thing. And, I, and there's other music teachers too that will nibble on my cookies. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the cookie thing is pretty good. It, it works well and it breaks the ice. And, and there are times during a lesson when you do have to take a moment to talk about things and just chill and relax, you know. And it doesn't always it. have to be all academic, right? It doesn't have to be academic all the time. Uh, if you're trying a technique and it just isn't working for you, then take a break, think about it, talk about it with the teacher, what, what's the problem, and, and right. talk about it a little bit, then have a cookie, or a piece of cookie at least, and then get back into it, and chances are it'll work out better. Now I heard that um, if a student's having a real difficult time, you have to move past the cookie and sometimes you open up a Molson beer, is that true? <laughs> That's for me, not them. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm going to put the cookie over here, is that all right? If it's there when I leave tonight, yeah. <laughs> okay, you know what we're going to do is ask um, Don a couple questions about, um, I guess, a student of yours that became sort of famous, right? Does anyone know who Neil Peart is? You know who Neil Peart is, yeah? Who does he play with? He plays with a band called too. Rush. Oh, you know too? You're right, he does. And... Um, I got to ask you a couple questions, and my first one was, did you institute the cookie back then? Did, did Neil have to chill no, with I'd you? No, I'd already eaten it by then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you, you know, I put some questions out there to my audience on our website and on Facebook, and whenever I'm going to interview someone, I say, hey, does anybody have any questions? And I think the question that came up the most regarding you being Neil's first teacher is they wanted to know... When you started teaching Neil, did you have any idea that he had what it took to become what he's become? Did he show that sort of uh, yeah. proficiency very young? Yeah, when you send a student home, it was different. You have to keep in mind, teaching back then was different too. If you said, okay, I want you to do this page and this page for next week, and they come back and they have four pages done, not just the two pages, and they're asking for more and so on, you know they're pretty aggressively going after their... their their drumming and uh, so Neil was always sort of one step ahead and uh, always practicing always playing and uh, you you can sense because he didn't he never missed a lesson it really didn't matter what it was never missed a lesson but uh, you know and I don't know it, it's so long ago I don't remember all the specifics of what I taught him um, and we we'll just put but, on a record <laughs> <laughs> he, but but he he was uh, he was going to be a drummer. That's all there was to it. If you read any of his any of his books, he uh, he used to play uh, on his sister's crib with uh, chopsticks and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, and he really went at it. And uh, I met him a little while ago. But but he's he's covered me in a couple of his books. And he said it was the inspiration. If 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 the student you know shows promise and that, even if they don't show promise, I try to inspire them. If, if they're not working as hard as they should be, I try to inspire them to work harder. Right. And it, but it doesn't do any good because if the students that are really working hard, I do the same thing with. I try to inspire them to work even harder, okay? And um, do you remember you sat in on a lesson the other night? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. And the yeah. young lady was really doing her darndest to do yeah. what she had to do? Absolutely. Yeah. It and was that sort of persistence. Yeah. Like, you know, moves everybody or someone to the next level, right? Yeah, and it's up to the teacher to encourage that. with your students, that's how they become better drummers. But I, I told you, when I started some of the students, I asked them if they want to be drummers or musicians. 
And that's a big point with me. But and if they and just, explain, like elaborate on that as much as you can, because I like that philosophy and I think other teachers and drummers need to know what that means. Well, what it means to me at least is right. that if they just want to sit and bang on the drums and, and the guy down the street's learning guitar or something and they want to hook up and jam and just play that way. But what I explained prior to this session beginning to, to you in the audience was that I put a track on that doesn't have the drummer. The drummer's muted and they have to listen to the bass player, the rhythm what's going on, get a feel for the kind of beat that should be played. Is it just a, a simple step like that or is it a double thing? And most of them do quite well at it. You know, we start with simple ballads and then work up from that. But it's important that they listen and they try to come up with their own beat for it. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and pretty well all my students do that without any real problem. See the little one there, she's smiling. Yeah. She knows what I'm talking about, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it works well. And, it, this makes it easier for them to apply what they've learned to different songs. And, uh, you know, right. I went through on um, last Saturday with one of the students. I had his mother along. I hadn't met her before. I had his mother along. And I told her what, what, what I was doing, what the process was. And I put the tracks on I was playing, that he was playing rather, or playing along with. And then I put the drummer off mute. And so the drum track was along. And the boy said, that's what I was playing. I said, yeah. And I did it to a couple more songs. And he says, I played that too. And I said, yeah. I said, but I didn't put the drum track on before. You've never heard the drum track, have you? He said, no. I said, well, that's what I'm talking about. You listen to the music and see what kind of a beat will fit the music. Right. You no, know? that's so, great. Yeah, that's how you do it. Um, talk to your students about how to tune drums yeah. and things like that? Yeah, the nice thing is back in, if you won't believe this, but, well maybe you will, but heads are plastic today. They're, they're, they're a form of plastic and all drum heads are regardless of manufacture. But when I started playing drums, um, plastic had just come out, but in the high school marching band I played in, the drums were still skins. You had to soak them in water and you had a rim and when they were very pliable like a chamois, you laid them into the room and tucked the right. head all the way around and then you'd put it back on the drum, minimal amount of tension on the head and, uh, and then let it dry and you put a wet towel over the top and they were skin at the time. They were and literally skin, that's why they're called drum, a lot of people still refer to them as drum skins and yeah. there are still some drums like taiko drums and some Latin percussion instruments percussion made instruments, from real yeah. Real height and everything. The only problem with that was if you played uh, in a very dry spot, the skin stayed tight. Okay, you didn't have to tighten anything. If you played in a very damp spot, like on a beach or you know, beach party, that type of thing, the heads would would absorb the moisture and they become softer and softer and softer. It was awful. So I can remember to get one of these heads to play, I had to put a light bulb beside it. Yes, a light bulb beside it to, to get the moisture up. out of it to tighten yeah, it up, so it act, you know. So, <laughs> so that's how things have come along. And uh, but you're right; they still call them skins. Yeah. And the variety, to, the variety. Once plastic came into it, the variety is so much larger than you. You, you only yeah. had, you didn't have that variety with the skins. Right. You know. And the other, the other drawback was that if uh, you were playing and the heads were damp like that, you're playing in a damp area and you tighten the heads up and put to get the tension on you wanted. Then you took them back and put them in your closet, which was a very dry area. They could split because they continued to dry and they just split. Yeah. That was very annoying, you know. Yeah, I bet. And, <laughs> Not as easy to change either. You brought up something earlier um, that, yes, I did have a, a great opportunity to, to sit in and watch you give some of a uh, lesson to Paige, which was really cool. And um, it reminded me of something that um, you know, just because someone is really good at baseball, let's say a baseball pitcher, doesn't qualify them to be a baseball pitching coach. And just because someone's a great basketball player doesn't necessarily make them a great basketball coach. We can go on and on with the sports analogy. My point is that a great drummer, a really good drummer, does not always make a really good teacher. You have both. Obviously, you're a really good drummer, but you have the elements for a teacher. And one of them that I notice is... Um, not that Paige was a problem, but I could still see you have so much patience and a teacher needs to have patience. 
Well, when you teach privately, there's, the beauty of that is, is that if you follow one approach and it doesn't work, you take another approach. And, and you, so you have, you have options on how to make that student learn. You know, the same thing that everybody else is learning, but I might have four approaches to the same thing. In a group, or a classroom if you want to call it that, you don't have that option. You just have to hope that everybody gets it the same way. So, yeah, so if somebody's not getting it one way, we'll do it the other way. Right. Have you always been real patient like that? Yeah, I. Do I need to ask someone here that knows you really well, or you could ask most of? I, yeah, no, I. It, it it doesn't do any good. That's when I take a bite of the cookie, okay? you know, but, or open the Molson. Yeah, open be, the Molson. Be, I ask because I can see how easygoing and patient you are as a teacher, and and not everybody has that ability. Well, you have to be patient when you teach privately. You have to be patient. It's it's if. If we're doing something and the student's having a problem, like I said, you find another way to do it, or you move on to something else for that day and come back to that another day. So there's lots right. of options. You don't have to, you know, right. lose it because of that. But, Did you uh, have to be real patient with Neil? Was he a problem? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is he a problem now? Do you have to be more patient yeah, with him now than you were then? Yeah, he makes a lot more money than I do. <laughs> you know, gee. So um, there, there are there are a couple of distinctions that some people can perform. They can do yeah. everything correctly. My favorite drummers are session musicians. Now, that don't mean a lot to you, but what they do is they go into the recording studio with any artist that calls them, and, and they lay down the track for the song, and that's what you all hear when it's played commercially. Now, they play for a great number of artists. They seldom tour. When the band goes on tour, or the artist goes on tour, they hire their musicians separately. And the session musician knows exactly what to do, how to do it, and does it at the right time, doesn't overdo it. He's there to support the music and the singer, or the, or the musicians, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. You're there to support the music, not to be a soloist. Mm -hmm. And some of my favorites, John Robinson and that, um, that's all they do, is just record. He's, John Robinson is the most recorded drummer in history. And Hal Blaine was pretty much there too back right. in the in the fifties and sixties. Right, I just and, interviewed Hal. Yeah, I know. Two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And uh, that was a so, treat. <laughs> so those guys are busy all the time, and right. and John Robinson has played with everybody. Most lately, I saw him playing. Like he'll do live concerts too with producers like um, uh, you know that they're out there like Quincy Jones and mm -hmm. and David Foster and so on and. Uh, the last concert I saw David Foster do, J.R. Robinson was the drummer. Wow. You know, yeah, I can't overdrum. Yeah. You know, so this is what I was showing you a little earlier before we started today, was about putting on a ballad and then roaring around the drum kit. You don't do that. You, you have to play the music. You have to support the music. You're not there to be a soloist. Uh, and that leads to my next question, actually. Do you also teach your students ballads in the beginning to also help teach them restraint? No. No, uh, the, what, I, I don't teach them ballads. If, I, if some of the older students, I said uh, students, I said I was going to teach you ballads and waltzes. Mm -hmm. We'll do a waltz today, I think. I wouldn't have the student for very long. So, yeah. so what it is, um, <laughs> as well, you know, <laughs> um, as as the students learn some basic beats, like I said earlier, they don't have any way to apply them. They're not sure how to apply them. So we put the kit on. I mute the drums in it, and the drum track in it. And they listen to it. And we start with ballads because, uh, especially for the younger kids, because that's the way for them to get a feel for the music, to see what's required. Right. You know? And uh, that's just, that, that's my method. I don't know what anybody else does. Right. But uh, that's, yeah, and it works for me. It works for the kids, it seems. Other than patience, Don, for all the drumming educators out there and for everybody here that might be thinking of becoming a drum teacher someday, what's the other most important ingredient they need to have as a drum teacher or educator other than uh, patience and knowing how to play the drums, of course. Well, a lot of experience. And you, you, have, to, you have to play all the different styles mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. You can't, right. you know, you can't just play one style, heavy right. metal or, or whatever you want to pick as a style. You can't play right. one style and expect to teach drumming. Okay, you have to play all styles. That's a great point. You know, yeah. I mean, Great. what was Paige playing for you the other night? Samba, right? Samba, yeah. 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 With paradiddles. With, yeah. 
yeah. all eight years of her. So I mean, you know. And for those watching, by the way, page is nine. You're nine, right? Nine. Oh, I blew it. Nine. <laughs> I thought she was eight. But, <laughs> but but the point but the point we're making here, or the point that I'm making here, is that I grew up. I played bossa nova, sambas, and begins, and all that kind of thing, plus the rock of the day and, and everything else along the way, waltzes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that, and Viennese waltzes, you know, a little faster, mm -hmm. and things like that. That's my background. So I had a very um, varied background in my lessons that, that I was given, and then in my playing experience, right. very, you know, a varied background. So that's important, too, for a teacher. You Great. Know? You, can't, you can't not have that, that varied background and expect to be, a, you know, and do a good job of teaching. Right. Tell, tell everybody before you sit down and play, or as you sit down to play, uh, what is the biggest advantage to having this tool right here that's with us? And, and go ahead and talk about the model number that it is and everything. Well, it's a Yamaha setup, right? It's a Yamaha setup, mm -hmm. yeah. DT Express 4. Um, one of the big things is the, the noise control, the volume. Um, when I grew up, I played in the back room on my drums. My sister played in the middle room on the piano, learning piano. My brother played banjo and guitar in the front living room of the house. And my mother would be at the kitchen sink peeling potatoes. And there was a lot of noise, but she said that didn't bother her. Wrong notes did. And she said, you're lucky, Don. I can't tell if there's wrong notes on the drum or not. So. Um, Right now, it allows the student, if there's, if there's three kids in the family and they're five, six, seven or something like that, right. the seven-year-old can go ahead and play his drums after the younger ones have gone to bed because you can turn the sound off, mm -hmm. put headphones on, and play into the headphones, and so far as the drummer's concerned, he's getting a full drum sound, right. you know? But all you're hearing on the pads is, well, you're not even hearing that, actually. You're hearing that, that's as loud as it gets. So it doesn't bother the kids, yeah. it's sleeping. And you teach with kits similar to this. You teach yeah. with the electronic setups. Yep. What is it you like about this particular setup the most? It's mine. Oh, that's a good, I own it. That's a yeah. good <laughs> aspect. So, <laughs> that makes a big difference, you know. Absolutely. Um, it, actually, I, I, I've added an extra pad. I could have three toms up here. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. You can see the mouth for it. Yeah. It's pointing down there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use it because part of what I'm doing now just involves the two, and I don't want to complicate the issue by putting a third one up yet. But, but I can put the third one up at any time if it's jamming at my place or something like that. Right. So it's not an, it's not an issue. Um, Great. And it's compact. And regardless of what it might look like, if, if uh, the cabling can be kept much neater than what it is. You know, but I'm a male, and I live by myself. So... <laughs> I don't have to justify it, but uh, um, that's one of the big things. Great. Why don't you show us something that you show your students or show us whatever you want as far as having to do with what drummers ought to know, you know, in their journey I, of becoming better I'm drummers. Gonna, I'm going to just start with a very basic thing. And okay. uh, it's just eighth notes, like I said. And, okay. And you, when you play the drums, you have to develop independence between hands and feet. You can't always play with one hand or the other hand. You have to go back and forth, and that's a given. And uh, there's, a, there's several things that enter into the whole thing. And uh, if I start with my right foot, right foot, one, two, three, four. So typically, the left foot always plays two and four in drum music anyway. Um, but I'd want to start with my right hand. One, two, three, four. But the right foot, right hand, left foot, left hand. Okay? But in order to get that little bit of independence, I'm going to start playing that right foot, left foot pattern. But I'm going to start with my left hand. One, two, three, four. So I've got my left hand playing with my right foot and my right hand playing with my left foot. And that's the way you have to do everything on the drum kit. You can't always play right with right, left with left. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we make it a little more difficult, one, these are eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. Well, now I'm going to play that same pattern with my feet and switch to quarter notes with the sticks. One and two and three and four and. One and two and three and four and. 
And then, so they play together, one and two and three and four and. Now that last exercise, for instance, um, I can start with my left foot and my right hand. One and two and three and four and one and two and. And again, that's developing independence. Okay, and that's a very important thing. So you should be comfortable with your left side as well as your right side. Okay, and most people that take drums are right-handed, but I do have some left-handed students. And you adapt. You, if, you're, if you're a lefty, then you learn to play just the opposite of what I was doing comfortably. So um, that's very important. Then there's the syncopation thing. One, uh, right foot, left hand. Left foot, right hand. And I've never seen that demonstrated really fast, but that is difficult to play at a, at a higher speed. And again, um, between the right foot and the left hand. That's the pair that we talked yeah. about earlier, okay? Right. But I said right foot and left hand, now I can do left, uh, left hand and right foot. And then left foot and right hand. Oop. We're sliding away here a bit. So you want to be able to go back and forth like that. And, and in some of the more difficult beats in here, it, it pays off for you. Because sometimes you're going to lead with your left foot, and, and, uh, and that's key to the whole thing. Now, I play a double pedal. I'm not an expert with it, but I play it. And that's what's missing. It's in a bag in the car that I forgot. So, <laughs> so I won't be able to show you that part of it. But um, If I could interject something, mm -hmm. um, what's so important about these lessons that Don's pointing out that seem so simple is that they develop exactly what Don's talking about, which is called limb independence. And limb independence is really what a drummer is all about, other than keeping time, of course. But the limb independence, um, without limb independence, someone is restricted to, if they're right-handed, they're typically always going to crash with the right, maybe always lead with the right, and always hit the snare with their left. With limb independence, it, it, you get to a point where it makes no difference whether or not you're right-handed or left-handed. You could be doing a roll on the snare or paradiddles and crash with your left over here and then with your right. And I mean, you could do anything and your left-hand, right-hand orientation just sort of goes away completely. And it helps to make you, I think, not only a more dexterous player with more dexterity, but um, it's easier to learn at least for me, it was easier to learn many styles because it opened my thinking up because everything was just easier to do physically. Well, that's the whole idea behind it. And uh, um, one of the simple things that we do, well, in actual fact, let me just digress for a moment here. We played these eighth notes here and then, and then together. We create a beat from that. It sounds uh, on, the, on the kit. Now I'm going to play this pattern. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now I'm going to drop, I'm going to drop uh, two and four on the right foot. One and two and three and four and one and three and four and two and three and four. And one. Okay, so my students know that that's the routine we follow. Each of the patterns we play, be it eighth notes, triplets, uh, paradiddles, whatever we go in and develop beat patterns from all of that, okay? Right. Um, my particular reason I like this eighth note pattern is it moves along nicely. Now, we do eighth notes, we do triplets. Triplet exercises would be the same way. Three on the top, three on the bottom, and three together. And then we combine things. We play an eighth note pattern on the... On the uh, on the feet and a triplet pattern on the top. And this is where the independence thing is coming in, okay? I'm playing a group of three with my sticks and a group of two with my feet. And that can be difficult. One and two and three and four. One triple, two triple, three triple, four triple. So, that takes a little bit of work. That's and a great lesson. Well, it's. I'm t what I was getting at was we do these things and then we show I show them how to apply these things in a real way, right. and uh, um, and that's part of it. Now, eighth note pattern again. That's a triplet pattern on the top. Yeah. All right. So 
bring in as much as I like, but that's the idea. So combining different patterns, you can do an awful lot more with them. Okay. Um, you spoke of always hitting this symbol, and you see that with the with right. the self, a lot of self dot drummers. They use the same hand for hitting right. the symbol all the time. One of the things to teach, and there isn't any student in here that hasn't done this already, I don't think. Right, left, right, right. Okay. I'm playing with my right hand, two beats here. This hand is free and has the time to get over to this side right. to do the cymbal pressure. But then, if we play here, this one's doing a double beat. Left, right, left, left. And I have lots of time now to poise my right hand and hit the cymbal wherever I want to hit it, right? So, so this is what it's all about. You can't, you know, you're going to run into problems if you do right. that all the time. So this is where the independence factor comes in. And I think uh, it also, the independence factor increases your creativity. So as you get to a point in your drumming where you aren't going to read music, you're not going to play along with a song, you just want to sit down and play and maybe see what you can do and make stuff up, the more dexterity you have, the more independent you are with your limbs, the more you'll see that you can just make stuff up. In the five minutes that we do have left, what can you demonstrate? Well, one yeah. of the things, one of the things that, that I said was important was if you're playing on this side, leading with your right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What's happening there is my right hand's playing with my right foot, my left is playing with my left foot on two and four. One, two, three, four, one. Because I can I can take it up a little faster, but that's your basic. That was beat. the first beat I ever learned. Okay, I learned it well too. I just use it all the time. <laughs> and then, but the the point being is that you can't change your foot pattern when you're playing that song. Okay, but there might be a time when you have to come over to the other side. So your left hand now plays the function of what your right stick was playing. Okay, so I'll I'll uh, move over to the other side. Four. One, two. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So, um, I, I I demonstrate that in a little a little different way, like the, the example of it. But the idea was now I was leading with my left hand over here on this hi hat combination, and my right hand was leading over here. So, going back and forth with the lead. Now, if I was to play, you know. Um, something a little fancier, and I need to do a quick break. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I can do that. This leaves this hand free to go around the kit. One, two, three, four. So it's just things like that. The independence part of it. I went from leading with my right side to leading with my left side, at least with the hands. Right. But you have to maintain the, the, the foot pattern to maintain the beat. So. So that's just one of the things. And um, paradiddles, we use them all over the place. And, and the line drummer is just going to play them like that. But on the kit here, I missed. And so that's a great way to develop fills. Paradiddles. If you don't hit your knee with if the you stick. Well, anything you hit becomes yeah. a percussion instrument. Yeah, that's true. As long as no one gets hurt, it's fair game. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a repercussion when you hit your knee because there's times in this kit you get used to playing the acoustic. And there's times when it comes straight down through here and got my funny bone. <laughs> and yeah, incidentally too, my dog cannot stand me playing the drums. Okay, and, and what kind of support she'll... system is that? Well, the cats don't mind it. The cats, I don't know. The cats will just like, <laughs> but the dog comes up, puts his head right here. So that means I have to start playing this one like this because otherwise the heel of the stick's going to bounce off his nose. But um, no, the paradiddle around the kit, and so on. You can just go randomly all over the place, make for interesting sounds. Right. We don't just use a single. There's a double, triple, and a paradiddle diddle. There you are. Paradiddle diddle. Right? So you can use them all over the drum kit, and it's, 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 it makes for a big difference from just being a line drummer and playing everything you know, on, one, in one, on one drum. And uh, and this is a paradiddle beat. 
going back and forth. Again, the focus though is on the two and the four. Two, three, four, one, two. Now, that's just with the sticks. We can do the feet the same way. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So now we come up with some really funky types of sounds coming from this whole thing. Right. And uh, the some of the songs that are recorded in here, um, I'll go back and just show you what I'm getting at. Okay. And then and I'm going to squeeze in a couple quick questions from the audience. Well, if I was to play... we're almost oh, done. If I was to play this song, I think it's the right one. You get the idea. It, it, it you know, uh, you, when you're playing a lot of double footwork and so on, it fits that kind of a song. You know, no problem. And the one that I really like to do, and this is a lot of fun. Paige will attest to, I'm sure. And Charlotte, you probably done this too. I pr I particularly like doing the samba with this. And this again. A little different foot beat, but it's it's paired along the top. So that's a that's a samba, and it's a paradiddle. In the day, you played them a lot of different ways. So, again, cool. it's a very useful rudiment, right? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know whoever invented the paradiddle, but it's very useful. Mr. Diddle. Mr. Diddle, yes. <laughs> we and have time to take a couple real quick questions from the audience, then I'm going to give away the last of the goodies. Does any you have a question? And your name's Charlotte? Okay. Now, if you speak in here, so we can hear. What's your question? Um... What does, what paradiddle does Don like better? Does he like like playing around on the drums, like going crazy or just doing s a slow paradiddle? Oh, oh I like moving question. around. I know what you're saying, Charles. I like moving around, okay? Uh, um, um, and you can also do paradiddle crossovers and so on, and all that kind of stuff. So I like, yeah, I like moving around on the kit. But, you know, you play them fast. You can do lots of really neat stuff with them. And you had a question? Yes. Okay. What is your question? I just wanted to know what year you started drumming. 1902. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know they had drums then? I, no. No? I, I, maybe, I was maybe 12 or 13 when I started drums. So 1902? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions real quick? Anybody? Anyone? Was okay. it, Paige, was it you that asked me, somebody asked me uh, how old I was, and I said 95. Yeah. Is it you? <laughs> Are you seriously? <laughs> I said, yeah, if, you, if you're 95 and you play, if you're, uh, sorry, if you play drums, you can get to be 95, no problem. You know. Okay, this prize, this is for, before we say goodbye real quick, because we've got like two and a half minutes left at that. This is for uh, Evan's drum head that Don and I are gonna sign after the show. And it's for Don George. You actually put a slip in here? Just oh, I, I, I use Evans. Is, is that what it is? No, it's, oh, okay. it's Zach Houston. Where's Thank Zach? You. Oh, great. Oh, no. and so hang on to that, and we'll sign it after the show. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Don so much. Thank you for being on Drum Talk TV. Oh, my pleasure. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you for watching. 
Uh, visit drumtalktv.com. Like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash drumtalktv. And if you want to follow Don and everything that he's up to on his Facebook page, all his information is magically right here, as well as all the information for the Guitar Loft. They have two locations here in Canada. As I mentioned, we're filming here at the Grimsby location, which is about 40 miles east. Like like people in Canada know what the Around miles the are. The it's 40 minutes east of Toronto, and then there's another store in Smithville. So visit them, buy lots of stuff, have fun playing music, and thanks for watching. I'm Dan Schinder with Don George. Thanks Thank for you. watching. Thank you.